Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian and Miss Berlin for Breaking Down Security. Hello. And it's very late our time. Uh, we pushed <laughs> it back because somebody had to go see Captain Marvel. I I mean, there, there's important things in life that you can't you can't put off. Yeah, I'll let it slide this time only because Captain Marvel is an awesome movie. I got to see it so far. <laughs> so yeah, enjoyed seeing it. What was it uh, last weekend? Yeah, last weekend. Yeah, very good. Very good movie. Oh yeah. Looking forward to the Avengers movie, uh, the final one here. So, um, which will be the last time I think we see a lot of those folks. Uh, some of them are like, oh, I, you know, I want more money, or I'm not going to play Iron Man anymore, or you know, whatever. So, yeah. So um, uh, the struggles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, rich people got problems. You know, right. millions of them, I guess. So um, before we get started, I uh, I want to give a shout out to Thomas. Uh, he's one of our slackers. I'm sorry we couldn't meet at uh, Pecos Pit in Seattle. He was here for Comic Con. He was like, "Hey, I want to you know buy you beer or something. Your podcast is awesome, and you're a very attractive person." I was like, "Well, I appreciate that, but." Um, you know, if you can make it great, it's fine. Um, unfortunately, I had to go back and uh, have a meeting, so we weren't able to make it. So I hope, uh, you know, you're listening to this and, uh, you know, welcome for the shout out. So, uh, Miss Berlin, you've been a busy person this week. Four podcasts. Yeah. Four. I, I, think, I think it's been four. It's been. <laughs> did we it's not sign? Busy. Are we not exclusive? Are, are, I'm, you, I've, are I you allowed to see other podcasts? Front. I told you right up front that I, oh, I'm not ready filthy. for that kind of commitment. Dude, that's filthy. All right. Well, um, yeah. So I, I know of one, the breaking into cybersecurity you did, uh, the, and you mentioned many hats before we started the many hats podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And there was another one. Oh, you and, uh, you and Bill, Mr. Gardner did a, did a show, right? No, we're scheduled to do one. Of Maybe it was just three. Oh, it would have been four if, but ours got canceled. Oh yeah, the one on Thursday. Or moved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things okay. happened yeah. in our. It would have been four, but it's been three. Yeah, we had a guest and, fall through, and like so. an online interview thing that I'm doing. Oh, so. okay, cool. Well, you're still one of the busiest people in in Infosec right now. So, uh, uh, you, your hacker's health is going on, Miss Roddy, or um, I think she said she was at Troopers, which uh, or someplace like that she's over in germany so i think that's she where is. troopers is yeah she's so. in germany and then when she comes back she's gonna run the b-sides austin thing for mental health hackers nice, nice. um because of my terrible scheduling uh issues that i've had recently right uh, i'll be in north carolina instead mm. um and then i'm going to b-sides nashville with the village goodness and speaking at i'm speaking I don't know if I'm speaking at B-Sides Natural. I know I'm like a backup speaker. Oh, that's um, cool. Because I like, <laughs> I turned in my CFP five minutes before it was due. Oh. Uh, and it was like, uh, this is my talk title. Have I ever let you down before? <laughs> wow. Wow. It's quite arrogant of you. <laughs> Look, I'm kind of a big deal. I'm Amanda Berlin. Here's my, you know, I got to talk. Title, <laughs> title, and content to be uh, named later. Just, but yeah, I want to talk. So you know, yeah. And Lauren, Lauren yelled at me, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I figured it wouldn't get accepted, but I did tell them I'd submit. Right. So I technically didn't break a promise. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, that's good. Um, so I'm a backup speaker for that, and then I'm also talking at Bill's. Um, it's the conference that they run for Marshall University. It's like a digital forensics conference. It's AID, right? A I D E. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, that's I'm a really good one. There after that. Yeah. So if, if one, if you people are wondering, uh, if, uh, out there where Mr. Betcher is, he's on vacation in, uh, in, in Big Bend, Texas, I think. So, um, if you are in Big Bend I wonder right what now, what they have in Big Bend. He likes him some hiking. I'll tell you what. Okay. Oh, All yeah. Right. He was telling me about these these hikes where it's like, oh, it's just a 10-mile hike, nice stretch of the legs, you know? And I was like, wow, that's that's impressive. So uh, he'll be back next week. Uh, he's going to be uh, with us uh, next week for, for another uh, podcast that we're going to be doing. So uh, last week we had part one with Noid. Uh, that was really great. Um, sorry if you came here expecting part two, but it's just uh, part one with uh, Noid th- last week. Uh, we actually have a guest this week as well. I wanted to have him on, you know, because uh, I didn't want to have him wait any longer. And his name is Zach Rubel. like the currency, but not. Um, welcome to the show, sir. 
Hi, thanks for having me. Right on. So, uh, Zach, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, what 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 makes you tick? Why would you get into InfoSec? And and you know, what are you, what are you doing right now? Sure, sure. So, my name is Zach Rubel. I'm currently an undergrad student at UW Buffalo, pursuing a computer science degree. And I've always been interested in cybersecurity ever since I got my um, Minecraft server DDoSed when I was in middle school. Um, and I mentioned that a bit in my talk. Um, this is a great experience. But that's how I got interested in cybersecurity. Well, um, what was yeah. your first computer? My first computer? I think it was some Mac, like a Macintosh or something. Oh, God. I'm pretty young. You're so freaking young. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, I'm just starting my security journey. Oh, God. I'm so old. (laughs) Yes, you are. Wise. (laughs) Oh, he's so diplomatic. Listen to him. I'm so wise. Wow. No, you're old. It's like that cake song. Friend is a four-letter word. Anyway, um, yeah, no, I actually turn 40 years old next week. So... Do you? I'm Happy s- birthday. I'm entering my semi curmudgeonness so yeah. I You've don't been have a at all ever since I've known you. <laughs> oh wow, wow. <laughs> I'm I'm peri or whatever, whatever, whatever the you know. But yeah, no, I I I appreciate uh, I appreciate Zach's uh, Zach's inexperience because uh, when I saw him <laughs> talk at B Side Seattle, I could have sworn he'd been talking for years um, at, at you know doing briefs and 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 talks because I was like, man, I was just blown away at the confidence that he portrayed up uh, on the. Uh, uh, during the talk. So, um, y- you were a very interesting speaker and, uh, yeah, I was like the first or second person to shake your hand up there and I appreciate, uh, appreciate you submitting your talk. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, maybe you could tell us uh, a bit about what the topic was and we'll get started from there. Yeah. So the idea of the talk was to see how we can chain together public web applications to create, um, command and control infrastructure. And we were trying to do this on on the cheap, so without putting any credit cards down, without paying any money. Mm-hmm. Um, so how can we find interesting functionality in public web apps to create um, advanced C2 infrastructure? No. Now you said we. Is this the royal we, or did did you uh, were you the only oh, one doing the research? No, it was me. Yeah, just me. Okay, so ro- royal we. All right. So yeah. your your actual title was living off the WAN, which I was like, okay, um, you're uh, the living off the land, like you know, with with attackers who use the tools that are already on the system to to you know do naughty things uh, instead of trying to upload you know netcat or you know bash scripts or something. Um, and yeah, the objective was. Uh, you know, to do things that are for the free, which is great. So, um, let me see, where did we get started at? Uh, da, 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 da. So you mentioned something called teaching assistant RCE, which we talked about before. And I got, I got clarification on this. Um, could you maybe you tell me, elaborate me on that? Yeah, please yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. So it might have been a little confusing uh, when I spoke at uh, B sides, but um, the talk concerns itself with the post exploitation phase, and I was I jokingly said T A R C E, um, mm-hmm. and that's because it's it's pretty easy to get initial access. So um, when I submit my code at school, um, the TAs run my code without checking it, so it could be a backdoor, and so I, then I have access. So there's a plethora of ways mm-hmm. to get access: phishing, T A R C E, um, you know, finding vulnerability and exploiting it yeah um do do they not realize that people could take advantage of them in that manner well i mean they're students uh, in the computer science program as well and they don't really have a security background so <laughs> ah okay yeah okay maybe that's something that you need to teach them about is you know oh i just you know opened up port 4444 on your box and shoveled a shell back to your your you know your system i'm hoping to graduate not get expelled but oh. yeah <laughs> Okay, well, if that's... Because he can get paid for it then after that. I guess if that's yeah. a goal, you could, yeah, go ahead and do that. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about what the the basics of C2 are and what C2 is. C2 is uh, command and control. Um, so maybe you could give us a little explanation of what that is in, in a nutshell. Yeah, so the way I broke it down in my talk was I, I gave a little example of um, what we do at the cybersecurity club at UW Bothell. Um, and the way we demonstrate some cybersecurity or C2 concepts there is we have people stand up a basic web application. We have them serve a static file with um, a basic bash command. And then we have them write a little Python malware. This Python malware scrapes the website, takes whatever it gets, 
and then executes it as a command. And so here we have the three components of a basic C2. We have the C2 infrastructure, we have the communication channel, and then we have the victim. Mm -hmm. um, the C2 infrastructure, that's our, our Apache web server, or Nginx. The communication channel is over HTTP, and then the victim is just any old desktop. Um, and some other properties we can we can draw from that is uh, C2 infrastructure um, needs to be able to send commands to malware. The malware needs to execute it, and then it needs to send the commands back. Mm -hmm. In this example I just mentioned, we're not actually sending the commands back, but um, in the ideal world, we want to send it back to have more uh, robust C2 infrastructure. Um, and now with these different components, we can start to switch them out um, and and play with, you know, maybe the communication channel. Maybe we use TLS instead of just plain old HTTP. Um, maybe we uh, have a scalable backend. Um, so that's that's the idea of basic C2 infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So he says, you say the victim receives the commands. Um, doesn't that require the victim to actually have some way of communicating to... Or, or receiving the or how how would the yeah. how the victim receive the sure in the sure first place? so the victim could reach out right because they're probably behind a firewall and they wouldn't be able to directly receive the command but mm -hmm. they could reach out to um, a, a public web app and scrape some data and then execute that data okay all right um so uh you you say you base the c2 selection on environment and some of the examples you give in here are um, uh, let me see. What's this one? Oh, I'm old and I don't know what the one with the cat thing is. Oh, that's GitHub. Okay. Discord. <laughs> Spotify. App. Spotify. I don't know what Facebook. this one with the blue F is. I don't know what that means. Yeah, that's I, Facebook, yeah, I don't know. Facebook, Twitter, and Slack. So, okay. One, one of the ones that surprised me was Spotify. Um, I don't use Spotify. <laughs> I haven't used it in forever. So, um, how can a Spotify, how does spot, is it a playlist or something that you're downloading for Spotify? Sure. Or? So we, we need to keep in mind with uh, C2 infrastructure, as long as we can communicate like a state change, some uh, form of information change, we can have a, a C2. Um, so with Spotify, all you have to do in there is search for um, a text field um, that you can modify with an API. Um, so you could have a description for a playlist or um, a title of a song. So any, any sort of data that you can change um, can then become a viable C2. Okay. Um, so anything with an API call. All right. Um... So if our malware can interface with um, Spotify's service mm -hmm. um, and read data from it and then can also change that data, then we can start to um, transmit data, uh, shovel data back and forth. Okay. And, and this would be hiding in what the ID3 tags of, of the, the music that's playing on your, on your specific playlist. How, how would something like that work? Um, so I haven't actually tested Spotify, um, but uh, there's, I think, there's comment sections in Spotify that you can modify or um, yeah, any, any field that has text input that you can modify. Okay. So like so um, you, you, you selected Slack to do your like Yeah, I selected Slack, um, but I'm just trying to show people that um, you can choose any sort of web application that can um, communicate a change in state. That's interesting. But you also be able, you also need to be able to view that. So if you put a review in a song, like, Hey, this song is the best with a hash, hash, you know, a hash or something, a Shaw 56 hash that, or 256 hash that, you know, it can be decoded and actually do something with, or a base 64 encoded uh, value, not a hash. Uh, SHA-256 wouldn't be reversible, but if you put like a, a base 64 encoded bit in there, could that be how you might use that? Sure. So if you, uh, I'm not sure if there's comment functionality on Spotify, but if you were to say post a com in a comment, uh, you'd have your malware pull down the latest comments and search for its username. And then whatever your comment was, it would take it base 64 decoded. You probably want to actually encrypt it not just base 64 encoded, but mm. then it would execute that. And then it would um, use the API to create a new comment and push the results of um, whatever just executed back up into Spotify. Yeah. So you you tried to do this on the cheap. This isn't the first time that these kinds of things have been used, right? I mean, um, Miss Berlin, do you remember do you remember something back in the day where people were using some of Britney Spears, like they were uh, putting or putting posts or something, and it was acting as a C two server? I have to find that. Uh, it no. sounds familiar. <laughs> hang on, hang on. 
Uh, feel free to ask questions, Ms. Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just now I'm just thinking about the Britney Spears stuff. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, jumping back to the, the Spotify example, you can just change the title of your playlist to um, transmit that data. Oh wow! Um, instead of just using uh, comment. Okay. Right. Huh. Yeah, so I found the one uh, bleeping computer, and I put the link in the show notes. Russian oh, state Instagram hackers post. use Britney Spears' Instagram to control malware. So, okay. um, so it's not it's it, it's a a fairly I, I think it's probably still fairly novel. Um, I know, imagine people use do use Twitter for that a lot. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Before I, I began this endeavor, I'd, I'd seen multiple examples of people using Twitter or um, Instagram with st- steganography. Mm. Um, Okay. Uh, but the the way this idea came about for me was um, our local ACM chapter at Utah Bothell asked our club to um, run a, a workshop or a talk at their hackathon. And their hackathon was on uh, bot development. So I figured, okay, let's create a bot botnet. And so that's how the idea evolved. And, and through that process, I, I started. Um, and then I, I decided to look up, hey, has someone else done this? And, and they had. I continued on. I try to implement it myself. And from there, this talk slowly grew. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going to put a link into the UW Bothell ACM group just in case anybody's uh, interested in that. Um, okay. So uh, you've, you've got here that um, – so like you said, it's not just limited to things like uh, GitHub or Gists or Discord or Slack or whatever. It's anything that can be changed. So, um, and, and looking into you know any of these examples, did you see any ca- – um, like did not saying there are or aren't, but did you see any cases where any of these um, sites or services or whatever try and I don't know search for it or block for it or uh, yeah, that's one thing I I didn't um, have time necessarily to pursue or yeah. I didn't create time for that, but that'd be something to look into because I know like I've uh, it's not the same thing, but I've tried to like create fake. Uh, Facebook accounts, right? And their mm. detection for that is way more advanced than I thought it was, mm. uh, th- than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't know if maybe they had stuff around that too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, so for these, uh, for these services, uh, is, is there any hard requirements like a publicly facing API or, I mean, what's the, what's the bare minimum needed for this? Cause I'm sure it won't work for everything. Like, I don't know, Gmail, you wouldn't be able to query a Gmail, uh, server unless you had some kind of login. I would assume anything that required like two factor auth, if it was enabled, probably wouldn't work or they forced two factor. So you need a, you need like a public API in this case that can, can query those things. Like if you wanted to query what iTunes or something like that right yeah sure so um you mentioned two-factor off and that would make it a lot more difficult to implement um uh, malware that way that would communicate with it um and and this talk i mentioned a lot how we're trying to keep the cost low and that's uh, we're trying mm-hmm. to keep the cost low for uh, human hours too sure. um so it's a lot easier if they provide a service and an api readily accessible for you to interface with mm-hmm. and so with slack um i use the real-time messaging api as the communication um, conduit um, and for other sites, you know, they may not provide a, an API, but you can still maybe post their website and just scrape that data manually. But mm. it, it becomes a lot more convenient when they provide an API for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I would imagine anonymity is kind of uh, important, too. You don't want to be caught. And um, I think somebody here asked a question at your talk about why didn't you use an AWS instance or a free AWS instance. I would imagine there's some kind of uh, paperwork that has to be filed or, you know, credit card or something. So, I mean, if you wanted to be nefarious, you could put a fake credit card number in or something that would defeat the, the, the credit card check. But um, the idea is to kind of be laying low somewhat and not, you know, saying, Hey, I'm Zach Rubel. I'm going to set up this, or I'm, you know, I'm going to set up this Amazon instance, you know, acting as a C2 that would leave a paper trail back to you. Right. Sure. And that wouldn't be as big of um, an issue if you're conducting a legitimate uh, pen test. And that was the scenario here. Ah, conducting a legitimate pen test. The reason I didn't use AWS, um, it didn't really come to my mind, but um, you have to jump through a lot more hoops with setting Mm -hmm. up an AWS account. And I think people can correct me if I'm wrong. You need um, a a credit card to put down and whatnot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, yeah. The free tier, you know, they if you don't shut it down after a certain amount of time, they they charge your card for whatever yep. unused yep. bits you've done. So obviously, there's a paper trail there. Unless you're using somebody else's credit card to do so, then um, the idea is to be as somewhat sneaky as possible. So that, yep. that makes complete sense. Um, so let me see here. You've got uh, Slack as a C2. What's this Slack shell that you uh, you mentioned here? Slack as a C2, but with PowerShell. I I thought Slack yeah. was like a Node.js uh, application or some kind of, something like that. What uh, What's the PowerShell so, all about? I'm not actually sure what they um, write Slack in, uh, the Slack service, but um, when I was going about uh, creating this presentation or a portion of this presentation for the ACM hackathon, mm-hmm. um, ha- partway through, I you know decided, okay, let me look up and see if someone's already done this. And um, so I have a slide in my slide deck basically calling out um, this Brent person who uh, uh, did something very similar, but with PowerShell. Um, so they implemented them on malware with PowerShell instead of Python, which what I what, what I did. Nice. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, cool. So uh, API token use for authentication. Yeah, he's got a whole big thing in here using PowerShell to interact with uh, APIs. So, wow. Okay, that's cool. Is there anything PowerShell can do? I mean, seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. Uh, da, 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 let me scroll down here. So... Let's see. So in this case, you've got, um, uh, I'm looking at your, your slide here. Um, we, we have the slides available. We're not going to be able to push them out just yet. Uh, Zach's going to tell us when we can release those, but, um, you're using something called the RTM, which was the real time messaging API. What, uh, what, what is, does that mean you'd be able to actually make an API call to post a message if you wanted to use an RTM and then that sends it back to the to the user. Does does the user require Slack to be on the box in this case? Yeah, so so what I did here was I chose um, Slack's real time messaging API, which um, allows you to. Um, I, I used a Python uh, library with a Python library and a token. I am able to push um, messages into a Slack channel, mm-hmm. and then I'm also able to read messages. So this satisfies that requirement of sending and receiving messages. So a malware would check into the channel. If it sees new commands, it would take those, parse those, execute them, and then send that data back to the Slack channel where the operator is at. Nice. Nice. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. all you need is Python on the victim box to make the call. You don't actually need anything like Slack installed on nope. it. Nope. We're just interfacing with their API. Huh. Okay. And it, because we are communicating with an actual Slack server, it looks like legitimate Slack traffic because it is. Right. Um, and that has a lot right. of benefits. And that's how we're able to fly under the radar because you're going to see in a lot of corporate environments they use Slack to communicate. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons we put the BreakSec um, on uh, the BreakSec community on Slack because it's easier because everybody mostly has Slack installed on their work boxes anyway. So adding another Slack instance isn't, uh, isn't, uh, you know, wouldn't wouldn't call off as many uh, alarms or uh, bring up as many alarms as if a Discord or a, um, you know, a yeah, matter the, matter most. Um, on the endpoint, you'd see it be acting different, right? On, on the endpoint, um, so I was more focused on the network side. I didn't really look as much on the endpoint side, so I, I'm not quite sure. Um, someone else would have to uh, speak on that end. Um, one way this could be detected, though, is if you had a really suspicious blue team, when you do connect to a Slack server, it, it does a DNS lookup for, um, you know, uh, breaksec.slack.com, whatever you guys' is, um, URL is. Exactly um, what it is. Domain name is. Um, but uh, so if, say, I'm impersonating Microsoft, I use that example, and I was um, Microsoft with a bunch of O's, uh, .slack.com, that would be suspicious. Hmm. But um, I mentioned this in my talk uh, when policy is uh, really restrictive, people subvert that um, and they start, you know, spinning up their own Slack servers or, or GitLab instances because they can't get access to legitimate ones. And and we can fly under the radar with that noise and um, then and, create our own uh, Slack instances and blend in because other people are doing that for legitimate purposes. Right. And honestly, the amount of people that actually look at DNS traffic, uh, nobody's going to catch it anyways. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if they if they have Slack in the environment, they're not going to notice that either. It's all going to hide in, in like like Zach said, and it's all going to hide in the noise. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it might look odd. So 
One of the things I was thinking of is if it's a Python script doing it, would there be additional bits like, you know, python.exe is making the call? Could you, it would be that process making the call yeah. to Slack. So in that case, there might be That's some... talking like endpoint detection stuff. It's going to be acting a little bit different yep, than the yep, Slack. Yep. Right. I didn't spend most of my time on, on the endpoint. It was more on getting the C2 infrastructure up and running. Um, but yeah, you could do a lot more to disguise what you're actually doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you know, once you get it over that API and stuff, it's going to bypass all firewall IPS right. stuff. So. Right. Um, yeah, the PowerShell one might be a little noisy if you're not expecting people to use PowerShell in your office. So, um, yep. same with know. Python, though. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, that that makes complete sense. Um, yeah, calling calling Python dot exe or the the Python library user user bin Python or whatever. So um, you had a demo. Uh, was there any kind of um, um, wh- uh, you showed us you showed us a demo at the talk? Could you explain what the demo was about? Or if you've yeah. got it there, you maybe you could run it. and We could do the screen share thing. Um, I don't have it right here up and running. I can record a video later if you want and send it to you. Um, that might be nice. We can post it, it to our YouTube channel. Um, if you've got the, if you've got that available. So I didn't mean to yeah. put you on the spot there, but you know, I, no, I just, it's okay. If- it's okay. Um, I can, I can describe it. So, um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, kind of, uh, you have a, imagine a Slack instance, whether it's your phone client, um, a web browser or whatnot, and you're in a Slack channel, you issue a command like LS, um, and then you'll just, see the results of LS pop up. So what was happening there is um, you have malware running in a virtual machine. That's what I had at B-Sides. Mm-hmm. It's checking in the channel. It sees LS. It grabs it. It's parsing that data, executing and sending the results back. So very simple demo, um, but I, I build upon this as we'll talk about in a bit. Right. So uh, on your slide uh, 14, you said the Slack benefits. There's trustworthy Slack servers, a TLS connection, the benefits of SaaS, uh, cross-platform experience. Um, can you use existing servers? So if you were, you know, let's say you got an invite to BreakSec and you added a, say, a starter post or something with a with a base 64 value there, Um is it is it required to set up your own Slack server, or could you use an existing one out there, like you know the NetSec one or uh, something? So that's like actually that? a really good question. Something I didn't think about. Um, you could, if they allow you to add bot users. Um, so we have a Slack server mm-hmm. in the Cybersecurity Club at UW Bothell, and mm-hmm. I didn't restrict who could add um, Slack bots. And so we had some issues there. But right. if if those other Slack servers don't restrict who can add Slack bots. I could, or someone else could just add a Slack bot, get that authentication token, and then they could use a Slack channel and use your own um, Slack server as a C2. And that's actually, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the things we learned on the Slack channel early on was because we're on the free tier, we only have 10 integrations and yep. only, a, only a certain number of bots that can be added. And uh, we learned pretty quickly to um, require... Uh, uh, verification of plugins or integrations and bots, uh, and don't just, you know, allow things willy nilly all over the place. So, uh, if you're a Slack admin, that might be something you want to look into to make it, make it, you know, not everybody can just add, you know, plugins and new apps and, and things to, to Slack because that could cause your world to hurt. Also, kind of surprised that they don't turn off all of that by default. Yep. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not about security. They're trying to open and collaborate and do all the things. So you know, um, that's you know. I met one of the Slack security guys at ShmooCon, not this year, last year. I, I know we have uh, people who work for Slack on our Slack as well. So yeah, yeah. we should yell at them. <laughs> uh, I've I've tried yelling at them to get me access to all of my logs, but it didn't work out so well. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, it's okay. I didn't yell. I was asking nicely if they had any kind of special tier for that. But um, yeah, it, it, that seems like it would be a, another way of going. You just hide in plain sight on somebody's really public and you know active Slack channel. Don't get yeah, in. that's that's extra trust too, right? You have Slack that's trusted, but then if you have like right. a NetSec thing, that's a legitimate thing inside mm-hmm. the security community, and you're able to get a token for a bot there. That's that's doubly trusted then. Right, right. Um, so what's the 
when you say you're making the API calls, what does it normally come back as? It's it's a REST uh, a REST API, right? So it's in a, it's in key pair format. Um, I'm getting a JSON response back. Um, okay, getting JSON blob, and um, yep. can you add additional uh, text in there to you know? add add to the json blob or is it just a specific i mean it must be a rather large blob so how do you how do you know where to parse through and what if somebody was to add their own base 64 encoded system or or whatever it is you're using just for you know grins and it causes your bot to go away what happens if you know somebody adds something yeah so first secure your slack server that you're using as a c2 right um you can add your bot to a private channel um, and then every bot you have should maybe have its own private channel because let's say um, a blue team finds your your Python code and they get access to a token. They could then maybe use that to find out what other systems are infected or mm. maybe someone could take control of your botnet that way. Yeah. So the actual implementation of this, you need to be careful about how you do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so not only just restricting integrations, but if you're using a, a well-known Slack, locking down, making it sur- uh, making so that people can't create their own channels might be might be an important uh, uh, thing. Yep. I know we're I know we're talking a lot about Slack, but the, you know that's that's the one I know because I'm too old to understand what Spotify is. So. Um, because I'm you know old now. So yeah, and I haven't looked into Spotify. It's just. Um, a- I assume it can be used as a platform. It has an API. You can sure. most likely uh, communicate data between it. So sure. I threw that on there. Yeah, and then definitely, uh, you know, any kind of Slack um, clones, Mattermost, Discord, all of those would, would be, you know, available. So um, you did mention Facebook and, and Twitter. Do they have access to a public API or are you just uh, doing the, the scraping I've seen like examples of Twitter before. Twitter does for sure. Okay. Yeah. I know they got in I mean, trouble with that, having oversharing of, of API calls and people were getting kicked off of it, but I didn't know if there were still ways to interact with uh, Facebook or Twitter via like a typical API. Yeah, I I highly doubt that they uh, shut down their API completely. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that's one, of the first, restrictive. That's, uh, that's one of the first things I learned how to do with Python. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, who is it? There's a YouTube... Sendex? Maybe. Oh. I don't know. He teaches you. He, he taught uh, how to do um, OSINT through um, the Twitter API. Okay. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Twitter still has a API, and I assume Facebook does too. Okay. Um, okay, good. Uh, I thought I accidentally played a YouTube video again because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> but so... There's an API key for those, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So going back to um, adding bot users, when you add a bot user, you get a um, a bot token, mm-hmm. um, an OAuth token, and you use the the bot token to um, access the workspace and interface with the API. Wow. Okay. So it's it's pretty simple, and the most difficult part of this is really um, uh, installing the bot and clicking through that GUI. So if someone were to continue this, you would automate the process. Unfortunately, um, if there are Slack people listening, they don't have any recapture or whatever. You just go to slackcom create, and it'll ask you for your email. You provide an email. It emails you um, an ID, and you put that in the field, and then boom, you have a Slack instance. So that can be very easily automated with like. 10 minute mail and all those temp email services. Mm, So, right. um, Right. Yeah. That's right. Just insights. Oh, I know. One of the new starch books. Yeah. Okay. I know who he is. Uh, So you said challenges to overcome. It says scaling. What, why is that a challenge scaling? Uh, I I kind of touched on it upon it just a second ago where it's, it can be difficult to generate um, a, a new a new bot every single time you want to um, uh, deploy it on a machine. So mm-hmm. you have to automate that process. And also, um, we're restricted to ten bots per Slack workspace. Right. But you can um, put some of your own crypto into it um, so that you can have um, you can share keys between um, infected machines. Okay. Okay. Uh, Does that make sense what I said there? Yeah, or no, no. That makes okay. that makes complete sense. So it says, what happens if your Slack gets burned? So you've got yeah, 
So, so say you have really suspicious burn. blue team, and they see that Slack is running on a Windows server. Okay, that probably shouldn't be happening. Um, and they they block access to your Slack server. So now um, we we need to innovate a little bit. Um, we can fall back on a, a, a couple C two principles. Um, we didn't talk about this before, but in my slides I have it. Um, we have something called a short haul server. And this is a server you use to uh, issue direct commands to your infected machine and get results back. Now, you also have something called a long haul server. And this is something you only use to regain access to that infected machine. Um, so if Slack, our short haul server, gets burned, we have something called a long haul server. And our malware, um, another piece of persistence on uh, the infected machine, will check and say every 24 hours, plus or minus a, a random amount of time, to see if, hey, does this operator need to regain access to their machine. Um, so we, we need to implement a long haul server. Okay. And, 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 and Slack in this case would be considered a short haul type of server or could it actually yeah. do both? You, I mean, you could use it as a long haul server, but in this um, instance, I'm using it as a short haul server. Okay. Um, with long haul servers, we don't need that real time communication that Slack provides. Um, All right. You just need to send one message every say 24 hours or whatnot. Okay. So uh, it says diversify, so not just Slack as a short haul server. Uh, central location for our long haul server to tie in either a client side program or some central server. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what you mean by a central location if the long haul server is the central location, right? Yeah, um, I'm not actually quite sure what I meant there either. We could probably <laughs> skip over that bullet point. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I was just thinking, um, you know, you were you were mentioned something for the long, uh, you know, central location. I was thinking of like a, a BitTorrent server or something like that, using uh, Open BitTorrent or something to to be able to send commands that way. But it might be a little little noisy or a little a uh, little more detectable because a lot of organizations do detect BitTorrent traffic. So, gotcha. Um. So you said one night in bed and you've got a little got a little house with sleeping G's, not Z's. So yeah. you yeah. came so up with a different idea. So when I'm idea. in bed, I was thinking about my B-sides talk. And all I had so far was Slack as a C2. And I thought, okay, I, I should really have more um, for my B-sides talk. Um, so I was thinking, okay, it'd be really cool if we could use Google as a C2. And not, you know, docs.google.com or, you know, their, their spreadsheets. People have done that before. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. And so I decided, hey, okay, how can I use Google Search as a C2? So I began to think um, about how to do that. And if you picture a Google Search page, um, you type, say, besides Seattle in, and up will pop uh, the URL. And then a little, and then right below that, there's a little portion that was actually sucked in from the web page. Mm -hmm. So if I can inject my content um, right there, then we may have a viable uh, C2 communication pathway. Um, so I began to think, how, how would I get my content there? How does Google actually get that content there? And so Google um, goes out and crawls the web and pulls in information about um, websites. So um, if I stand up my own web server and Google crawls that, it can maybe pull in some of my commands. My malware would perform a Google search and then you get that command and execute it. And it would now be going over google.com as a C2 instead of over my sketchy website, right? Um, so I began that process of how do I do that? And um, uh, I, when I'm on a pen test, I don't want to wait a couple of weeks to, um, to get regain access to my malware. And I found out with Google, when I submit a URL for it to crawl, it's going to take up to a couple of days to a few weeks. And so that wasn't really viable. Right. Um, so I, I switched over to, to Bing. Um, and it told me, hey, we can crawl up to um, X amount of URLs per day automatically. And so I thought, great, my talk is done. Um, so I, I let my talk rest for a little bit, and I came back a week or two later. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that uh, your, surf your, um, your website will only surface when the quality criteria is met. And so I didn't want to do... Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, search engine optimization for my C2. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to go back to uh, Google. And if I can't publish content on my own web page and have Google crawl that, well, why don't I publish content on a different web page that Google crawls a lot? Right. Um, and so I decided to use 
um, Reddit because Google probably crawls Reddit a ton. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, am I going too fast here? No, no, no. The uh, so I mean, uh, yeah. There's fairly fairly popular Reddits, uh, fairly infamous Reddits. Uh, just recently, that uh, yeah, I could definitely see you you adding to that. Problem with the if you pick the wrong Reddit and you've got some moderators who are actually doing their job, they would pick up on that fairly quickly. Is that being like a spam post, right? Yep, yep. Um, so. If- for this instance, I chose to use the front page of Reddit because um, Google probably crawls out the most, and it turns out it crawls it a lot. Okay. Um, and I chose the Reddit rising section because I thought that would have the, l- the least amount of eyeballs. Um, and so when I tested this out, actually, uh, people were very curious about what I was doing. I have a slide here in my slide deck that has a response to one of my um, comments that says, is this base 64 or something? So Mm -hmm. people were wondering what I was posting. Um, In fact, it wasn't, it was an encrypted string. Um, Uh. And then in another instance, people uh, just downvoted my uh, post because they were really confused why I had this random string on, um, on the subreddit. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if it gets uh, downvoted too much, my fear was that uh, Google wouldn't uh, pull that data in. But yes, you're right. There is um, a potential for an admin to be like, what are they doing? That that doesn't look uh, legit. It looks a little fishy and they may um, stomp it out. Yeah. Now, um, you could also create your own Reddit subreddit that nobody would have access to. You could set it to private, I guess, or something as well. And that would be a nice short haul kind of deal, right? Well, um, Google still needs to crawl that site. Um, um, well, you can make an uh, API call like you you did with Slack stuff, right? Does yeah, so yeah, sorry. Um, you said short haul. Yes, you could um, use Reddit as a short haul server if you wanted to. Cool. In this instance, I was using um, huh. it as a portion of my long haul uh, server. But yeah, yeah you're right. Um, and, you were, and you were just commenting. You weren't actually doing new posts or anything. You were just commenting on the stuff that was already yes. in rising. Yep. 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 Oh, I see. Calling. Okay, so it was less likely to be removed by a moderator if it wasn't like a, a top top level post. Yep. Because they're yep. not going to be reading all the comments. Oh, that's nice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Or um, you could do um, uh, YouTube comments probably too. Hmm. Yep. I imagine. Yeah. Um, so one one question I've got is you you've got a random uh, random string in there. How do you how do you actually search for that when you're scraping? Yeah. Yeah, is it a regex or what? So, um, a way to test this out is you go to google.com and you can use some basic Google foo. Um, so you can type site colon um, reddit.com and then a specific string you're searching for. Mm-hmm. So I had a keyword and my keyword was like LOL WTF bacon, some, something crazy like that. No one else would type. Right. Um, and then I selected uh, only search in the past 24 hours because I don't want to get other people's results. That would mess up with my probably weak parsing on my malware side. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then up would just pop, uh, it would just pop up that single post with the LOLWTF and then that encrypted string. So I was searching for a keyword here, um, which would allow Google to uh, surface those results to me. Okay. Uh, you didn't happen to use... Uh rebloggy.com or anything for your CNC because I'm finding LOL WTF bacon uh, on those sites too. So No. Okay. No. Is okay. that recent? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you, it, it's well, actually it's a uh, top Tumblr post. So that was, I don't see a date for this, uh, this one, but yeah. So yeah. So one of the things that helps is, Hey, search within the past 24 hours or past weeks. So that mm-hmm. way, I right. mean, there's a lot of stuff on the internet and Google has a lot of things. We don't want to get, the other stuff we wanted to get our content right that makes sense that makes sense okay yeah. and i'll i'll publish my slides so that um people can follow along with this so they can understand better what i'm talking about okay um so you said the apparently you were doing some research you found a novel search engine based method for discovering command and control servers from december 16th 2015 yeah, so partway through um, working on this, I, I again decided, hey, I wonder if anyone else had done this. Um, and it turns out someone had. I haven't read the paper. It seems like an interesting paper, but they have pretty much the same things I was thinking of just a couple years uh, earlier hmm. when I was like probably in high school. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm no, rubbing it in. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Happy birthday. Can you, can you drink it? Legally, can you drink it? 
Oh yeah, yeah. I can. Okay. They actually had a question. In, there's a speaker gift for B sides, and they're like, "We weren't sure if you're old enough, so with this bottle of alcohol or like a Google um, uh, listening, no, not a listening device, a Wi-Fi device." Um, but right yeah, on. so it's kind of funny. Okay. All right. So you've got you you've got a slide. If anybody asks, you didn't get it from us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I, I took the Google thing. But there you go. <laughs> so it says one week later and you have uh reading a bit more. So there apparently this wasn't all of, uh, you know, happy happy good times here. There were some issues that came up. Yep, yep. I think I kind of skipped over some of the issues, but um yeah, so I thought I would be able to use Bing to um crawl my my web page, mm-hmm. but it turned out um a certain quality criteria needed to be met. Um and so um, because that didn't work, I started to get really nervous and then I was clicking around the search engine and I was thinking, okay, how can I get my information in the search engine for my malware to perform a search and pull that data down? And so then I clicked on a news tab and I was like, Ooh, what if I could publish news articles? Oh. Um, and cause that's, you know, those want to be really, uh, relevant and published right when it happens. So that's it's pretty real time, but it turns out probably as uh, when I was talking to people, um, after the 2016 election, it's probably a lot more difficult to publish news now. Um, I could jump through those hoops to try to create some fake news, but uh, again, that's going to be a lot more difficult than it needs to be. Right. Depends on the website. They'll probably let you post some things. <laughs> sure, but um, like Bing <laughs> aggregates the news, and I think you right. need to have a special account for it to actually publish it. Um, same thing with Google, but I definitely looked into it. The, the idea was you didn't want to create a paper trail back to yourself if you were actually doing this for a you know, an engagement, not necessarily being a bad guy, but like to for the engagement that you don't want people doing research and finding out you're just you know, more is a little more uh, legally questionable and Tr- again, a lot true. more hoops to uh, jump through and right. you can do it a lot easier with um, Google crawling Reddit. Right. So, yeah. so was there a way you actually figured out how to, to solve it? Like maybe using GitHub or anything like that? Um, so one thing we didn't, uh, touch upon is we have our short haul server, which is Slack. Mm-hmm. And then we have our um, long haul server. So our Google crawling Reddit and us uh, doing a Google search. Right. Now those are two disparate systems, but what if we want to tie them together to make um, uh, it easier to use? Um, and so my idea was, why don't we add another Slack server so that um, uh, this Slack server communicates with um, the other Slack server and also posts to uh, the the Reddit API. Unfortunately, with Slack, you can't you know take those programmatic actions to post to Reddit's API. Um, you're limited to a certain type of functionality. Thankfully, earlier on in my research, I stumbled across a website called Glitch.com, and Glitch.com is amazing um, for people like us. It provides oh. you; it's basically a free serverless platform where you throw Node.js code at it, and it runs it for you for free. You don't need a login; you can click a lock wow. button, and it just locks it, so only you have access, and you get command line access to a Docker container. So sweet. <laughs> is there anything so, Node hasn't uh, done to screw up the internet so far? Oh wait. Oh. One more t- what? Is there anything Node hasn't done to oh, screw up the internet yeah, so far? Yeah, I mean, yeah. this sounds like a nightmare. Um, so, you know, my idea here was just write a little Python code that um, interfaces with the real-time messaging API again to pull data from our Slack operator server and then push it into um, the short haul server. And then the malware would take the contents to the short haul server, wow. execute it, and then send it all the way back up the chain. If we want to recover our malware, you execute a recover command in the op- Slack operator server, and that goes to the that gets pulled in by the Glitch server, and then Glitch posts the Red API, and then you know you have the whole process. Now, the, um, the night before the talk, I was you know stitching these things together, and I had tested before if um, I could connect to uh, Slack from Glitch, and you know what? I could. But the night before the talk, I, I put my code in there, and it it just didn't work. Um, I was able to connect, but I wasn't able to pull data. Now, I'm not sure if I was able to pull data when I had tested it before. Um, uh, and so that didn't work. And so I was, I was really nervous before my talk. I was like, do I stay up all night before my first talk? Or do I just tell them what I would have done? I decided to tell them what I would have done and how I would have solved this. Um, and so earlier I mentioned Glitch, it can run your Node.js code. Um, 
And so now we need to figure out how we can simulate um, the sending messages back and forth. So Slack has a couple cool features that we can use. Slack has something called um, Slack Events API, or um, yes, the Slack Events API. And so when I issue, uh, say, I type a command or uh, something in the Slack channel, it will um, publish the results of that to some endpoint that you specify. Mm. So now I can specify uh, my glitch uh, Docker container that's running my Node.js code as an endpoint. So when I put a command in the Slack operator server, it sends that data to the Glitch server. Um, and Slack also has this other sweet feature called webhooks. And this is where you can post code to um, an endpoint um, on Slack, and it will shove that whatever you post into a, a Slack channel. So now we've um, satisfied that uh, sending and receiving messages of uh, command and control infrastructure. So wow. when we type a command inside um, a, a Slack uh, channel, the events API sends it to uh, API endpoint and Glitch, then Glitch sends a post request to the other Slack server uh, webhook, and it gets dumped in there. Then the malware uh, connects with the real-time messaging API, takes that data, executes it, and it goes all the way back. So um, I was finally able to get that working today uh, before the podcast, so that was great. Um, but during the talk, I said, okay, this is theoretically how we'd fix the problem. Mm. Um, and it that works. So that was a lot of talking. Are there any questions you have there to clarify that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the slide that you have in, uh, like the next to like, no slide 43. So it, it shows the operator server, the man in the middle, you know, the Reddit posts, the, you know, everything back to your victim. You could also have the victim you know, confirm that the the command was done as written. You could, since the RTM is a, a you know is bidirectional, I think you could probably you know verify. You could probably query and find out how many bots you actually have or how many victims you actually have if you queried everything out. Correct. Uh, what do you What do you mean specifically by that? So, like, like the victim would be able to query how many infected people there were, or no? Your Your short haul server would be able to query how many victims you actually have based on, you know, who you know how everything's it, connected, right? Uh, b- via the real time messaging API. Yeah. Um. So the issue with that is, um you need to interface with the real time messaging API with um like Python code or whatnot. Mm-hmm. You You can't. Ex- you, you don't have programmatic behavior with a uh, Slack. So um, from the short haul server to the operator server, you can't use the real-time messaging API. Um, so that wouldn't work. Ah, okay. Um, so how would you take inventory of how many bots you actually have in this case? Uh, so you'd have to implement some code in the, the glitch middleman, the Node.js um, thing, and that would keep a, a counter for you. Um, I've only really been using this with, uh, one, um, uh, uh, bot right now, but mm-hmm. this is where you'd have to scale and, um, yeah, get okay. a little more clever. Well, my, 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 my thought was, uh, let's say you've got 3000 victims, you know, fairly decent, but you don't want to use all 3000 to do whatever. Let's say you're a bad guy. You want to take 1500 of them and use them to mine whatever the cryptocurrency of the day is. And then the other 1500 be used for say denial of service type attacks. Um, is there a way for you with your current configuration to, to do that kind of separation or is it all, all, all for one and you know, um, one for all? Yeah. So right now is more proof of concept and this particular setup is more meant for um, a targeted engagement okay um, less of a distributed like infect a bunch of computers sort of thing we don't need slack to do that we don't need to communicate in real time with something that's doing uh like monero mining right mm-hmm. we can use uh something else for that right um can could you give one victim a different command than the others or are you just basically blasting it out to all of the victims at uh, the same time so if everyone has their own um bot uh key you'd have you'd send them different um commands and you could join the bot to a different channel in the in the slack channel mm. um there is slack server yeah yeah cuz you said there was up to 10 bots on 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 the free version of slack so technically you could have your your botnets respond to different bots or different bots could tell your your victims to do specific things yep yep and then you can actually have um 
more victims subscribed than just one to a single key if you have each of the uh, victims have their own private key and they can decrypt individual commands just meant for them. Hmm. So you, you can scale it, but um, that becomes a little more difficult. Okay. So so Ms. Berlin, I know, works at a, a managed service provider and, um, you know, I'm sure people who are listening to this are like, well, how do we defend against something like this? So you wrote this, you created this Frankenstein. How would you kill it? <laughs> how would I kill it? I don't want to kill my baby. <laughs> well, in this uh, case, you know, us, us defender types or, you know, us folks who, you know, f- may see this from, you know, incident response kind of things. If I was wanting to kill it, what would be the easiest way to do that? Because it seems yes. like there's no, it's, uh, it's all kind of insulated and disparate. Yeah, so um, there's multiple ways this could be taken down. First, you have, um, so say I'm infecting uh, Acme Corp or whatever. Um, they could deal with the issue, either on the client side or, or on the network side. Uh, but you also have um, the services I'm interacting with. They can also try to detect some of this. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as, um, like on the Acme Corp side, uh and anomaly detection, I mean, I, I haven't been in the industry as long as all of you, but I would imagine if, again, a Windows server is communicating over Slack, that's not good. Um, uh, but the, what makes this so difficult is that we are using legitimate um, uh, services. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'd have to throw out there, like, I wouldn't worry about this stuff if you haven't patched, if you don't can't deal with the low-hanging fruit. Right. Right. Um, if, if we are doing this for a red team engagement, um, you wouldn't want to start off using Slack as a C2. You'd mm-hmm. want to start off using something basic to see if, if the blue team can catch that. If they can, then you slowly st- start to advance. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you. If other people do, um, I'm all ears. So, Ms. Berlin, I think it would be fairly impossible if, uh, unless you, you know, are you going to block Google? No. Are you going to block Slack? No. Are you going to block Reddit? If you're going to do like uh, like man in the middle SSL inspection, yeah, and like full packet captures, maybe. Yeah, but then Um, what if I encrypt my messages that are going to my clients and they decrypt it? Right, then you're just going to have more encrypted data, too. Uh, you, well, uh, if, uh, a couple of like the more advanced firewall things can do like man in the middle like unencryption of SSL stuff. Sure, right. sure, sure. So it, um, yeah, I mean, if your client encrypted it and then sent it over and had it, yeah, I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, endpoint stuff, uh, you know, with the fact that, yeah, that server shouldn't be talking on Slack or that server shouldn't be running py- those Python that Python code or PowerShell or whatever you want to run with it. Right. Um, I mean, on the endpoint, it seems like it'd be easier because I mean, it, it would look like normal network traffic. Yeah. Honestly, you know, if you, if you're looking that deep into network traffic, um, I, I, your endpoint shouldn't be that wide open that you'd allow that to happen anyways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. One thing, uh, theoretically, you could detect it this way is I'm sure there's some sort of cadence that a normal Slack desktop client checks into a Slack server. I'm not sure what that cadence is. I haven't done that research. But if my malware is checking the Slack server um, at a much faster cadence, I could tip you off. But really, that's a lot more specialized research. Right. That has yeah. to be done. I guess if it's making the, the same API call several times a minute or, um, you know, it might get noisy in that respect. Uh, could you also use this to exfil data? Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't implemented it so we can do that um, right now, but I um, mean, the most basic form, cat, Etsy, shadow, that's exfiltrating data. Right. With Slack, you have the ability to upload files, so it's a matter of interfacing with that API again, and it makes it incredibly easy for you to do it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously you'd have to find some heuristics there. I, you know, the victim's machine is zipping a bunch of files and all of a sudden it makes a web call out to a Slack server that, you know, or, you know, and and that's a fairly large packet in this case. That might be something uh, if you were looking at a Slack channel with a rather large, you know, uh, packet that might uh, that might tip somebody off or, you know, if they're using it in the office, I, I don't I don't know of a good way to defend against this. Um, I mean, if people you, share code anyways on Slack. So you're normally uploading yeah. files and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's been some 
talk about Slack not being all that secure because, you know, apparently you can, with the right URL, you can actually view those those posts anywhere on the web. So Really? Huh. Uh, I don't know if they fixed it since the last time that we had evaluated Slack at my, uh, my, my last employer, but uh, uh, you could send somebody a link or share a link and it would, you know, be a automatic, uh, you know, they could just pull it up in a web browser, that specific that specific URL. So let me, let me see if that's still the case here. Copy. Let me see. Anyway. So, um, okay. So it it will be very hard to protect against this because as you're saying, you're hiding in the, in the shadows, so to speak. Um, I mean, we're hiding in plain sight, kind of, we're using services that people normally use in their day to day lives uh, when they're working. Right. So, um, see if you can click on that link there, uh, Zach, in the uh, in the chat window right. I sent to you specifically. Um, see if that's still a thing. So let's see. Uh, no, it's asking me to sign in. Yay! Okay, they fixed it. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, it was just a link to a sh- uh, show post that I put up uh, a week ago. So that's pretty cool. All right, good. Well, I'm glad they fixed that because that was a major issue at one time. So. Um, wow. Okay. So if, um, I, I would put it out there to the rest of the break sec, uh, people, all the listeners out there, um, one, don't recruit Zach for your evil botnets, uh, please. <laughs> um, two, if you have a way that you can think of, of, uh, defending against this, we'd love to hear about it on our Slack channel, uh, or in our Twitter, which we'll, we'll mention shortly. Um, let me see. Uh, you know, I think, you know, not letting, a bad person in, on an endpoint is probably a good. <laughs> well, one, how would he There's get There's a pipe? lot of stuff before you get to that point that uh, you can yep, use to yep. defend. Okay. So it would require a proper, say, like a fish or a malicious download, I would imagine, right? Yeah, yeah. We already have uh, privileges on the machine. I mean, right. we had to do recon. We had to find vulnerabilities. We had to exploit those um, before we even got to this stage. Mm-hmm. So if you can prevent those initial things right. or mitigate them somehow. Okay. Or you're just a student somewhere and you have all that access already. <laughs> yeah. Students with too much time on their hands <laughs> should be out, you know, <laughs> freaking, you know, doing other stuff. Anyway, young punks. Anyway, no, um, I'm, I'm just kidding. This is, this is fantastic work. This is, I never had the opportunity to do any kind of stuff like this when I was, when I was your age. Anyway, of course, he had abacus is back when I was your age um, as the only computer. So um, what what's the next steps for this? Is there anything you're planning on adding to it or, uh, you know, refining your refining your methods? Uh, so I mentioned this earlier. It's a pain to um, get new bot tokens, provision, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. automating it would be cool. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, probably automation. So I click a button and everything spun up for me, really decreasing the cost to get things up and running. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm uh yeah, this is if I was a blue team person, I'd be uh I'd be uh, very scared about this. So, um All right, so you just joined Twitter just before the podcast started. Um because, Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> because you, you young people don't don't use this. You're all on the Instagrams and the, and the WhatsApps <laughs> and stuff of the world. See, so you know, you're not on the Facebooks, of course, because that's what grandmas and you know old people use, like myself. So, uh, if if somebody wanted to discuss with you this more, you know, more thoroughly, how would they how would they find you? Sure. Uh, so my Twitter handle. It's the first time I'm saying this ever. Is send. Um, rubles, so R U B L E Z. So rubles, the Russian nice. currency. So send me rubles. Nice. Um, I have your email address only because I think you took it off of your your slides, but uh, um, or no, I think I, I think you gave it to me. That's what it was when I was asking to to speak with you. So um, it makes me special. Uh, <laughs> so uh, are you planning on putting any kind of code or any of this up on uh, GitHub so that people could maybe? continue the the research or are you at it you know making it uh, like a com, you know you're one of your cs projects what are you what are you looking at for this uh if people want i can i can probably publish some of that code um i have some of the code already published for when i did a smaller portion of this um presentation mm-hmm. um since then though the api changed and it kind of broke some of that code so i may republish some of the fixed code 
So, okay, that's an interesting question. So you said the API broke. Uh, if if places like Slack, sorry, not they, the API. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, so that that it's a fair question though. If if they change, the only way that this would really break is if Reddit or Facebook or or the Spotify's of the world they change how their their API you know sends you information. If they've changed formats, that could be a way that this would break itself, right? It's not self healing yeah, yeah. in so any way. So it's actually one of the things I experienced. I have a slide in here that um, uh, what did I learn? And, and one of the things was services shift. They they're constantly updating, change, and that's that's what happened to me. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't doing an amazing job uh, parsing the output um, for the first version um, of the of their API. Um, mm-hmm. And when they shifted it, uh, when they changed their API, it, it broke my code. Um, now now it's better, uh, but. You're right. If they change their API, it could mess with the whole um, architecture of the uh, of the command and control infrastructure. But if you have something like uh, Google as a C2, um, that's less likely to probably be uh, broken. And so you still have that long haul channel where you can say, hey, get me back my access. Cool. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, Zach, thanks for, for coming on. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you again at CSEC East. I know you were able to join us uh, on the 6th, but uh, I, you know, we got busy and, you know, the, the talk was fairly interesting. What did you think of uh, Dr. Callen's uh, threat, threat modeling? Was it uh, something new for you? Yeah, so actually right now I'm taking a secure software development class and we were just talking about threat modeling. So it was, it was really nice to see um, another perspective and sorry, not threat modeling, threat assessment. I know he mm-hmm. made that distinction. Yeah, yes, he <laughs> um, did. But it, it was it was cool to see it from another perspective. I'm still trying to piece the, um, the pieces together for um, how to actually conduct those and how to do it effectively. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Okay, cool. Um, just a reminder, I don't know if you'll be able to attend, but uh, UW has uh, has a, has something going on on the 29th. I won't mention it on here. I'll, I'll mention it to you offline. But uh, uh, Adam Shostak is going to be speaking there, who's oh, cool. kind of like yep. the father of – yeah, he's about the he's like the father of uh, of threat assessment and threat modeling. So uh, um, we'll see if he can get you to get you available to that. It's at the UW campus, so you won't have to go yeah. very far. Batman's Kitchen. Uh, it's at a yeah it's at something similar but i'll i'll, I'll let you know after the the sure. show's off so cool. miss berlin uh i know you've got a lot going on podcasts because we're not exclusive apparently uh how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to talk about all the things that you were involved with well twitter's easiest so at infosister i-n-f-o-s-y-s-t-i-r or at hackers health Awesome. Um, and um, Mr. Betcher, of course, is the lead developer, and I would assume the CTO because he's the most technical person for LogMD. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, finding out information about how LogMD might help you, uh, you know, in your environment, you can go to log-md.com, which will take you to the IMF security site. Uh, him and Mr. Goff uh, are also on the Breaking Down Incident Response podcast, which I hear um, people enjoy greatly. It's a it's another podcast all dedicated about information uh, incident response and uh, and doing forensics and and logging on certain systems. So if you're interested in that, uh, there is a link in our show notes, or you can go to imfsecurity.com and go to the Beat your uh, BDIR podcast in the upper right hand corner on the site. So, uh, let's see a couple things here. Oh, um, workshop.com. I mentioned it last week uh, at the end of the show. Uh, Spectre Ops has given some training at workshop.com. Uh, along with Tim Tomes, he's giving his uh, practical web application pen test training. So if you're interested in signing up for that, you can go to workshopcon.com forward slash events and sign up for that. I'm assuming there's still spots available. It, it happens in about a month. So you can, uh, you know, sign up for that. Uh, you know, the, the price, uh, the cost is, um, uh, I think still about $4,000. Uh, but it's, you know, three days of, of really excellent training. Training year, learn a lot from that. So, uh, let me see. Uh, thank you to our patron, uh, patron people. Thank you for supporting the podcast. We are listener supported currently. So, if you are um, interested in giving a couple of bucks as a like our tip jar, you know, you got interest, you know, got something interesting from this uh, discussion with Zach, please feel free to hit us up on our Patreon. It's uh, in the show notes as well. So, uh, 
Oh, yeah. You can follow the Twitter. Uh, uh, podcast Twitter is BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. And if you'd like to join our Slack, which is very active, uh, it is moderated. We have put the moderation hammer down this week because of some things that happened in the news. So um, you can join us uh, by DMing BreakSec uh, on Twitter or sending an email to bds.podcast at gmail.com. And we do all moderate because uh, I moderated this week. I had to be the bad guy this week. Um well, I had to because I think it was <laughs> it was requirement. So yes, for sure. We have a social contract. We don't uh, allow. We don't take no shit. Well, I wasn't going to say that, but yes, we take none of that shit there. I tell you what. Um, but no, we uh, you know sometimes when the topics devolve, uh, you know our social contract says no politics, no uh, you know being mean to people. So we had some somewhat semi political stuff that had to be uh, had to be curtailed. So we fixed that. Um, all right. Well, I think we're good this week. Uh, next week, we will publish part two of Noid's interview with us, uh, talking about how you can you know, get the most that you can out of uh, the languages you have with, you know, speaking to developers and, and how security people can be myopic sometimes. Uh, we're also going to talk about, you know, how to make your reports, especially if your consultants uh, read better to both the technical people and the upper management, which is always something that uh, I myself have a problem with, and you'll hear me discuss that in the, in the show. But um, if you've ever written a report, you know, it's got to it's got to work for both the technical people and the people who, you know, need finger puppets to understand what XSS is. So, um, yeah, so that'll be out next week. And uh, we've got a, another great show coming up with uh, with some people all over the world. So um, we're going to be hopefully talking to them, and uh, that'll be up in a couple weeks. So, uh, yeah, thanks again, Zach, for coming on. If you have any other topics of interest or you want to join our Slack, uh, you know, just hit us up and we'll, we'll get you on there. So we appreciate you coming out, though. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you for having me. Right on. All right. Well, that was it for uh, Breaking Down Security uh, here at the World Headquarters outside of Seattle. Have a great week. Be nice to one another because the world is just crazy, uh, especially on Twitter and in our Slack. Uh, be nice uh, and take care of yourselves because you're the only you you have. And we will talk to you again soon. See you later. Bye-bye.